set um, came together at the beginning of the summer around um, with three groups, Occupy Student Debt Campaign, that was a group that both Winter and I were a part of, Free University, and Occupy Theory. And we started to talk together about debt and try to understand sort of debt as a system um, on, on a deeper level than just sort of looking at, for example, just student debt in isolation. And the reason that we wanted to do that was we really wanted to figure out ways to um, build a, a political movement that had some power. And one of the problems that we found with the student debt campaign was that um, we had a pledge where, and we still do, we sign it, uh, where you can, where you would say that after a million people had um, signed the pledge, we would refuse student loan debt, right? And people raised a lot of different criticisms for that. Some were moral, like it's immoral not to pay, and some were practical. And the practical one was specifically that with student loan debt in particular, there's really no way out. Um, the laws are not in student, uh, in student education debtors' uh, favor at all. And so as a result of that, we had looked at the idea of how other forms of debt really come together. And one of the ways that we did that was through working on this project, the um, Debt Resistors Operations Manual. And one of the things that became incredibly obvious when we were uh, researching all the different forms of debt, particularly education debt, housing debt, and credit card debt, and along with that credit scores, is that the system of debt cuts across um, racial lines and class lines, of course, as well. And so we just have uh, begun to really try to understand all the nuances to that. And this conversation is really a part of us trying to maybe come together and think with others, think collectively about all the different kinds of ways that debt is racialized. Cool. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Winter. Uh, so Pam and I were thinking that for this uh, teach-in, we would basically present for five or ten minutes each, and then after that, lead into some questions that arise from our presentation. Um, and then without answering them, maybe just kind of throw out a bunch of questions to kind of just sit there, and then slowly together kind of explore those questions as opposed to a question and answer. Um, I think particularly since we're not experts, um, I just really started reading about debt about two years ago. Um, and as I was researching in the debt, oper debt Sisters Operations Manual, I think we learned that there's so much to learn about debt. Um, so as Pam said, I think we wanted to see this as like collective exploration of this really interesting topic um, and terrifying topic of raising debt. Um, I would say on a personal level, you know, as I began to organize and strike debt in the Occupy movement, I started hearing and seeing more and more that a lot of people of color felt like debt didn't talk to them. It wasn't an issue that mattered to them. And that it was seen as this issue for the middle class that is kind of falling apart. And you know, I think that was further problematized by the fact that the organizers were often um, white and middle class and educated. Um, and I think that as we researched this, this manual, we, we really started to see how deep down the rabbit hole debt goes and how it really starts to, you start to see all of the, the issues that we've been talking about, you know, patriarchy and racism and capitalism, you see it in debt. Um, so I think that we'd like to present how, what we saw as we um, started opening this Pandora's box um, and what we've learned. Um, so I guess I would want to start by by asking like what you know what debt is. You know this group is called Strike Debt, and it's not really clear what it means to strike debt. You know a lot of people think that it means asking for debt forgiveness or relief among the debtors in the United States. Um, others see it as you know asking for forgiveness throughout the world and all different types of debt. Um, but I don't think it's really clear what kind of debt we're talking about. Um, you know, you can see debt as, as being personal debt, and I think in the manual we've explored a lot of different types of personal debt, um, and started to expand that definition, uh, particularly along the lines of the, the unbanked people, the fringe financial services that we'll talk about. But there's also business debt and corporate debt. Um, there's you know, public debt, government debt. Uh, there's you know, many different categories of debt. So kind of asking how these all come together. Um, 
and yesterday or two days ago at George Fenster's talk, he wanted to differentiate between commodity debt, which is debt that is used to buy commodities, and profit debt, which capitalists have been using for the of years to make to, to borrow in order to make more. And how, particularly through student debt, that, that distinction is becoming less and less clear. Um, I would say that for me, researching, um, I found kind of three different angles of approaching debt and ways of thinking about debt. Um, and I would say that they are, I think one is a weapon, um, particularly um, by the 1%, a weapon of geopolitical dominance. Um, I think it's also a, a method of extracting wealth. Um, and I think that that interest, opens interesting questions about its connection to labor. Um, and I think overall we've, we've started to say, you know, it's not just, debt is not just a thing that people have, it's a system, um, a system of domination. Uh, so it's not just exploitation and extraction, but it's also domination. Um, so I can start to think about how race plays into these, um, and even, you know, it's not really clear what race is. Either. So I think that we're dealing with all these terms that have been contested for years, um, and I think debt is just starting to, to become this problematic category. Um, so I think the first one, the weapon of geopolitical dominance, um, is possibly the, the most interesting because I think that's the uh, it opens up the, the like global and historical perspectives on debt and race. Um, particularly, you know, I started looking back at like the '60s and '70s um, and the operations of the World Bank and the beginnings of these, you know, um, these institutions that really started using race as uh, sorry debt as a weapon. Um, and I think that you can begin to see it, particularly by the time McNamara becomes the president of the World Bank, um, you begin to see that debt becomes a kind of neo-colonial structure. Um, and here I started to kind of, I'm not at all an economist, an economist, but I started to read a little bit about how this works, and it seems like there was, you know, all this kind of extra capital, extra cash floating around, particularly in dollar form, and the 1% really, you know, was looking for a new, um, field to commodify it, to make money off of it. And I think that one of, the, one of the ideas was to invest it in third world countries, particularly where communism was starting to really become a danger to the capitalist class. Um, and they realized that I think through loans, especially with conditions on those loans, you can start to form the conditions of a type of blackmail, which is, I think is a different kind of colonial and imperial structure than we've seen in the previous few hundred years. Um, and you know, I started to, to realize that you know a lot of the economists were explaining that the early wave of loans in the 60s and 70s um, weren't so much through blackmail, but they were kind of with the idea of changing the structures of these economies so that they were export focused, so that basically a, a type of dollar dominance, so that when you loan all this money to foreign countries, particularly you know impoverished countries, and say you need to pay us back in cash, in dollar cash that they need to make dollar cash. So to do that, they become export um, economies and they no longer can rely on themselves. Now they're relying on first world countries and in particular the rules of first world countries. Um, and that, I think, you see then they need to import their basic foodstuffs and water and you know, infrastructure as opposed to doing it internally within the country. Um, and I think that we could argue that this is a main cause, this, this type of, of loan dollar dominance is a main cause of some of the, the global crises that we're seeing, you know, hunger, water, education crisis, health crisis, the numbers are staggering. I mean, if it wasn't for all these countries paying back, you know, I think most of the African countries are paying back at this time between three and ten, ten times the amount of money is going to debt repayment as it is to basic social services and infrastructure. I mean, that's astonishing. And the amount of money that it would take to, to solve these crises it's almost nothing compared to the amount of money the GDP of the U.S. Do you know anything about the kind of like rolling jubilee project? Is, is, is anyone thinking about that, formulating that here nationally? Uh, that's a good question. I think we should definitely we should definitely hold that question up until we're done. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that you know we start to see that that this system kind of leads into the the second point, which is you know a massive system of wealth destruction, um, and I think that this goes hand in hand with the neo neoliberal model. Um, which privileges privatization and um, finding more and more sectors to commodify and make into profit-serving sectors. Um, and I think that you know we see this model kind of shift from the third world to the first world. 
So this model that was imposed upon you know, the, the developing countries, now we're seeing being imposed on the first world countries through austerity. Um, and I think that you know, one of the really interesting things we're seeing now is that debt is becoming itself commodified. I think that's really how we can begin to explain the financial crisis, is that through the securitization of CEOs and all this bullshit, really what we're seeing is debt itself becoming its own market. So it's not only that you know, our, our education and our healthcare and you know, the basic social services are becoming commodified, but the debt that we go into to pay for those because of the cuts in social services is itself becoming commodified. Um, and I think that when we try to think about how this, how this ties into race um, and imperialism, I think it, you know, it becomes pretty staggering. Um, I think you know, Anne's going to be doing a talk on municipal debt tomorrow, and I think this kind of ties in a lot of this, a lot of you know, the previous structures that have dominated for the past few hundred years, um, which have certainly not gone away. You know, we know that low income and communities of color are still heavily, you know, there's still, the overlap is still absolutely astonishing. So when we see municipalities going into debt through this system, the cuts in social services beyond just education and food, but welfare cuts and cuts in you know, bus lines, all down the line, you know, are clearly affecting people of color way more than they're affecting white middle class. So I think this is the first way we can see that debt is not just an issue of middle class, but it is, it is affecting people of race, people of color far, far greater. And I think that one of the issues we started to see coming up in the manual is that debt is being used within the first world, within the U.S. in particular, um, to ensure that these class and race lines and the way that they overlap, not only that that remains unchallenged, but that it becomes further entrenched. Um, and I think one of the ways we can really see that, I think one of the two most beautiful chapters of this manual, uh, Nicole actually worked on them, we can talk about them in greater detail, are these fringe services, you know, what we're calling the poverty tax. Um, basically, we found that for household community, I'm sorry, for um, households that are making $30,000 or less in this country, on average, they're paying $2,500 in fees and services because they don't have access to cheap credit. Um, and that's astonishing. That's 10% tax on people who are already poor and already getting services cut. So, I mean, really, we're, what we're seeing here, I think, is a further commodification of the unbanked. Right? So, we first see a kind of cutting off of credit um, to people of color. And when they do have access to credit, it's usually at very high interest rates, which Pam will talk about. But when they don't have credit, don't have access, particularly if they're not documented or just you know are coming from communities that just don't have access to these banks and institutions, uh, we're seeing massive exploitation. And basically, I mean, this is just plundering, I would say. Um, you know, the numbers, I think Nicole knows way better than I do, but you know, I think that the numbers are there's at least 20 million people who are using these services that don't rely on mainstream credit. You know, it's almost a tenth of the country. And I, I think the numbers of uh, race are something like that black and Latino communities are six or seven times more likely to be unbanked and to be exploited by these services than are white communities. Um, and you know, you're probably all familiar with these services. Before the manual, I had never really paid attention to these services, but you know, payday loans and rent-to-own centers and auto loans, pawn loans, and you start to go into communities of color in the city and you see them all over the place. Your payday loans are almost completely unregulated. In the states, they have to be kicked out of. And the interest rates you see are almost up to 400%. It's totally insane. I mean, it's just completely insane. And I think beyond just this, you know, there's, there's, when we begin to talk about what kind of protections debtors do have, uh, one of the, the chapters that I heavily researched is bankruptcy. And you think that, you know, bankruptcy is one avenue that, you know, maybe offers some relief. It seems like it actually could be race neutral. You know, there are these chapters that you can file for bankruptcy and basically get rid of your loans. And as I started to research more and more of the bankruptcy chapter, I realized that, of course, these, these legal codes for bankruptcy reflect the, the system at large, which is highly racist and patriarchal. And, you know, even before the 2005 reforms, there was a study that was done on race and bankruptcy that basically, its final conclusion was that the bankruptcy code is implicitly racist. It's written to protect white communities. And that's, you know, in subtle ways by favoring, um, you know, wealth over assets, I'm sorry, assets over income, by favoring, um, you know, heterosexual married couples over, you know, 
more nuanced forms of social relations. And it found over and over again that these uh, forms that were privileged were much more dominant in white communities, of course. And uh, as the 2005 reform, bankruptcy reform was passed, which basically was passed by the creditors, I mean, let's make no mistake, they bought out Congress and passed this reform. And basically, that reform allowed um, the bankruptcy apparatus to determine which chapter people would file under. And Chapter 13, which is basically a creditor scam, as I see it, um, no, you no longer have a choice when you when you file. And what we found is that Chapter 7, which is a form of bankruptcy, which really does offer protection, you have to often give up your assets, but you really do get to forgive your debt. In Chapter 13, you have to go into these really complicated payment plans. Most people don't complete them and end up in more debt. And of course, what we found was lawyers basically filling out paperwork so that African American Latino debtors were much more likely to end up in Chapter 13 and end up more fucked than when they started. Um, and the numbers were really staggering. I mean, we found there were there were studies that found that in most communities, Black and Latinos were three times more likely to file for bankruptcy, which I think says a lot about the economic structure as it exists in the country. But what's really disturbing, as I said, is the lawyers pointing and filling out paperwork for twice as many black and Latino debtors to go to Chapter 13, which is basically a credit for scam. And I think what was really the most disturbing uh, statistic I found was that 20% more of black and Latino cases for bankruptcy are dismissed. Given all factors, other factors remaining the same, you just find absolute racism in the system. And these are, you know, lawyers and the bankruptcy judges basically just dismissing black and Latino debtors and much more frequently than white debtors. Uh, so I think that that's kind of where I'll stop. Those are kind of my findings, and I think Pam can go into some other assets of this. Um, yeah, wow, that was really, that was great. That was fascinating, actually. Um, let's see, I think that where I could take, sort of, like, start from there is to kind of just give it, like, a little bit of an assessment of how things actually are in terms of debt um, in really simple kinds of ways, and then talk a little bit about how things may have uh, gotten there, okay? And then understanding that in, the, in terms of labor as well, I think. So, um, just to be kind of... Uh, about it because I think that we want to get into uh, conversation. Um, and most of us have heard of redlining. Do you guys know what redlining? Redlining. Redlining is basically pretty simple. It's when a bank determines by a, by location what kind of credit they're going to offer you or not offer you. And so um, that's been kind of consistent amongst all the different kinds of debt, like typical consumer debt. Um, for healthcare, I actually don't have numbers. Uh, healthcare is actually incredibly difficult to research and very secretive. Um, but I think that we could imagine that if you go to a, um, you know, a hospital in a predominantly black area and you're using hospitals in a certain way out of that, um, or minority area, um, then you're going to receive a certain type of um, situation. But it's really obvious when it comes to housing. Um, with housing, um, it, like in our current crisis, what you can find is that with uh, African Americans with good credit, credit that would get them, you know, just regular uh, loans, um, uh, prime loans, prime mortgages, 40% actually receive subprime mortgages, right? And this is consistent with student loans. You can also see this in the form of private loans, where uh, people of color across the board tend to take out private, private loans when they do not have to. So private loans have the harshest terms, they have higher interest rates, etc. Um, and you can also see this in the form of credit cards, which there's a lot of evidence to believe are, in essence, uh, redlined in terms of interest rates that are offered. When you receive a credit card offer, part of that offer is based on um, where you live, and uh, your interest rate is linked to where you live. And you can also see this in terms of credit scores, where you have um, 
enormously high numbers of um, uh, people of color with low credit scores, meaning that they're going to get the highest interest rates. So you can see that very clearly in those three areas, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done to really understand um, medical debt as well in these terms. Um, so yeah, so I just want to kind of just say that's kind of the, the question of like, that's kind of the state of where we are today. So it seems like, I guess, there's been a lot of criticism around the connections. People, you'll see people with signs saying like, debt is slavery, right? And there's been a lot of criticism of that terminology. I'm not really sure how I personally even feel about it. But I think that we could actually look at, um, look carefully maybe and examine together um, what that really entails. And one way that I was kind of looking at it is that previous to a debt-driven system, slavery in the United States was a system of, uh, of labor, right? It was a system of being able to extract labor from people. Now, if you kind of um, skip, there's a period post-slavery, and then there's the period that's post-oppression, right? And if you look to the period post-oppression, when we started to accumulate a lot of uh, consumer debt, we find that the first place that we started to do that was with housing. So prior to the Depression, you only had 40% home ownership in the United States. There were a lot of problems with that. I won't get into that. Post-Depression, you ended up with 65% home ownership. And of course, redlining was a huge part of that. Prevention of African Americans being able to acquire property, generally speaking. But also, this was actually a very new system um, of, that related to labor because it basically was a limitation on, uh, it was taking away some of your, at least some of your, freedom around labor in order to acquire some form of an asset, right? And we've kind of continued along that line. Student loan debt came about as part of this process, right? Based on future labor, future wages, we were acquiring debt. So I think that these systems are very similar. You acquire 86%, I think it was, of Americans, if they lose their job, uh, use credit cards to some degree to, um, to, uh, to be able to survive. And so, again, we see the basis of debt being related, this expansion, this massive expansion of debt being related to future labor in a, po a post-slavery economic model. So, um, and I think that actually Winter was making me think when he was talking a lot about the international things about Haiti. And I, I have this belief, I don't know how I like came to it, but I actually don't, I really don't think that the world could ever be just until there's justice for Haiti. Because um, Haiti, of course, many of us already know, was put into debt because of um, the debt was assessed by France for fighting them to be free of slavery. And so they've been in a perpetual indebted state for freedom from that system of labor put into a different system of labor. So those are kind of, I think, um, yeah, one other one other kind of idea I want to just throw out for thought is, um, so Winter mentioned that one of the things that we found when we started researching and talking about the, the manual was that um, People of color generally didn't see debt as their issue. Maybe they align themselves more with labor as their issue even, right? Um, how do we get into the debt system in the first place through being able to access labor um, that would provide us with the ability to take on debt? Good debt and maybe bad debt too, of course, right? Seeing it that way. And then I think that you can also see the flip side of that, or maybe, it, I'm not sure the exact relationship yet, maybe we can figure that out together, but as opposed, if you're not involved in the debt system, you, I think that you might be involved in the prison system, right? Because that's another way of being able to live outside of the debt system, um, and probably you're, you're somewhat forced into a choice between these two these two systems, which one do you have better access to, which one is going to provide you with better opportunity, actually, at some level.